So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the beautiful land on which we stand, and where the Biennale of Sydney takes place. We pay our respect to Elders past and present, and to all First Peoples, especially those joining us today. It's such a treat to be here in the company of so many distinguished people today and uh, those who are carrying the memories of the early days of the, of the Biennale of Sydney. It's the final event in the Biennale Archive Story series. And it's both a pleasure and an honor to be welcoming Tom here today, the Artistic Director of the second Biennale of Sydney in 1976, titled Recent International Forms in Art, which was staged entirely here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Uh, we thank you, Tom, for being here today and for sharing your slides and memories and, and uh, wisdom about, about this period and about that very important Biennale. And as well, I'd like to welcome, welcome Roma and Fiona, wife and daughter, Tom's wife and daughter, to share um, their, their experiences perhaps as well uh, in the Q&A that we'll have afterwards. It's so important to look back to the founding history of the Biennale of Sydney. It's a record of also the transformation, the very important transformations that have uh, occurred over the, over the past 45 years. And every time I say it, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded that is nearly half a century ago. And it is, it is a, um, a, 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 also a great honor to have Luca Belgiorno Nettis here representing the family that had the vision that in, in Australia in 1973 we could have something equivalent to the Venice Biennale. <laughs> and uh, we are just um, so grateful for that vision and uh, for the support uh, over, the, over the very long period of time that has kept um, this idea alive. Um, it's hard to imagine after 20 months of Mami being here in the city, but these are among her last days, her final days in Sydney. She'll be going back to Tokyo, having completed the task of being the artistic director of the 21st Biennale of Sydney. And I think every one of us in this room and many beyond this room agree that it's an important and very worthy uh, exhibition, series of exhibitions, where one of the key things that she's brought to us all is a deep sense of responsibility to history. And it's um, the Biennale itself is playing a, playing a, a star role in this very building, um, just steps away from here. And um, it sounds like a, an easy task, or we're going to put up some, some letters, or we're going, to, we're going to show some posters and think back uh, to the Biennale, but it's been much more than that. And we are so grateful that the Belgiorno Nettis family as well as the Biennale, have gifted their archive to the National Art Archive, which is housed here at the Art Gallery of, of New South Wales with the wonderful staff, the wonderful staff and under the leadership of Michael Brand. And it means that um, this talk today, for example, is going to be entering that archive as well. It's going to be taped. And uh, it means that f 50 years from now, people will be able to look back to this day and this turning point of this of superposition, equilibrium and engagement from Mami Kataoka. It's a real gift 
to, um, to Sydney and to the country that she has envisioned a way of simultaneously looking forward and looking back. I, um, I want to thank you personally, Mami, for the, for the work, uh, the honour and, and uh, privilege of working with you. And on behalf of every member of the Biennale team, and I also want to uh, thank you in the name of the Board of Directors. We have two representatives here today, uh, Penelope Seidler and Anne Flanagan. Um, and Anne herself was working on one of the Biennales, I think she said back in 86 or 88 or two, two years. And I also want to acknowledge um, one of our partners who is here today, Alexi Glass Cantor, of art space because we could not accomplish what we have without the wonderful collaboration of every one of our exhibition partners and if you've seen the exhibition at, at art space you see the love and dedication that has gone um, fr come from your team as well and every single team and here at the art gallery it's a long introduction but it's an important day and uh, I th thank you most sincerely for coming. And it's my great pleasure now to hand over to the Artistic Director of the 21st Biennale of Sydney, the wonderful Mami Katoka. Um, it's my great pleasure um, to be here today. And thank you for coming for such a wonderful, sunny, nice weather Sunday. And, uh, yeah, I did start this uh, Archive Story series in December 2016. And uh, I thought about doing this as soon as I was appointed in July 20, 2016. And uh, initially, I was trying to visit Tom and so many other people who used to be part of the Biennale uh, to do my private interview. But I thought it's, it's so important to uh, have all these uh, visions to be recorded and then also to share with all of you. And uh, by doing it, then I think every one of you brought your experiences and memories and everything together. So I think archive had been so important for me to really learn what have already done in the city um, during the uh, Sydney Biennale. But also I love watching you uh, doing this, all these little reunions and uh, bigger reunions <laughs> and remembering all of these things that you have done because that's something you already have it as, as a history of the Biennale. And then also I was probably more interested in knowing what other people has done already than what I was going to do. Because uh, there's, uh, the Tom is going to talk about a little bit, but there had been quite a lot about Japanese artists. I think it's more than 90 artists participated in the last 20 times. So uh, it's very well known Biennale from my country too. And uh, I just wanted to see uh, exactly what was happening here and how important it was to look at the development of Biennale together with the development of the, the contemporary art institutions. So uh, when there was nothing but uh, art gallery in New South Wales and an art space started and an MCA started. So uh, gradually, I think a role of a Biennale has been changing, but also as a, as a larger contemporary art festival for the city, it's very unique. There's not much Biennale right now happening in this region that uh, all of these existing in institutions and non-art institutions like uh, Opera House and uh, uh, Cockatoo Island are coming together to celebrate the global contemporary art. So uh, it, I just really would like to thank you for, thank all of the history for, to um, make my understanding of the Biennale so rich and fruitful. And I'm so happy to end my archive stories with the beginning story. <laughs> so uh, let me introduce uh, Tom Maclow, uh, who was artistic director of the second Biennale of Sydney in 1976, recent international forms in art. 
staged entirely at the Art Gallery New South Wales. And uh, prior to this, he was known for the groundbreaking Mildura Sculpture Triennales that ran from the 1960s until known f uh, until 1980s. Developing out of the Mildura Prize for the sculpture founded in 1961, which is actually quite interesting because Biennale, the f formally it was a uh, uh, Transfield Art Prize. So the form of a prize shifted to the Trenales and Biennales. And uh, the Mildura Trenales are uh, remembered for their experimental uh, character and as a platform for post object performance, artworks, environmental, feminist, and collaborative art practices. Uh, seven time direct, uh, several time director of the Triennales. Maklo was also curator of the first Australian sculpture Triennale in 1981. And the Tom's Biennale of Sydney edition in 1976 explored new forms of sculpture and uh, included video performance and uh, male art, each of which tested the definition of sculptural form. This was also the first Biennale which with the clarity, a clearly articulated curatorial theme developed by a single artistic director, uh, which had been a hallmark of the Biennale until today, and that saved me a lot. <laughs> His Biennale included 80 artists from 10 countries and uh, focused on the Asia-Pacific region, which is, again, so interesting and important. And participants from New Zealand, California, Japan were selected for the uh, ambience of experimentation that would suit Australian attitudes to sculpture and art generally. So without further ado, please welcome Tom Maclaw on the podium. Uh, thank you, Mami. Thank you uh, to everyone for coming here. And uh, I hope that I can race through too many notes on the past. But let me first uh, use my own introduction because I've uh, got a subtitle to it, The 1970s Mildura Model and Some Ripples. Mm -hmm. Seamus Heaney wrote many poems about his earliest home in County Derry, uh, my home county, one of them mentioning a white enameled bucket of drinking water that always sat in the family kitchen. As a small boy, Seamus was fascinated by some circular ripples appearing on the still water surface when local trains rumbled past. The pure well water acted like a seismograph, reacting to distant movements created outside his family home. My recollections of uh, the events over, from over 40 years ago in Sydney and Melbourne also seem like ripples or echoes that have been quietly uh, reappearing and reacting to each other in some unexpected ways. So if I appear to use that uh, metaphor tiresomely, um, that's what got me going. I suppose that I was uh, recruited for the 1976 Biennale of Sydney, and you can ask Leon because he's the man who asked me, <laughs> because of the increasing reputation and critical successes of the four previous Mildura sculpture triennials that I directed in the decade of changing recent art forms between 1965 and 1967, specifically, uh, sorry, 1975 in Mildura. Um, now, let me see. There we are, I pressed the button. <coughs> um, by 1975, the triennials were reputed to have an unbiased approach to widely diverse range of experimental artworks, and the new art gallery building, which you can see in the middle there, that block-like shape, uh, was uh, the core beginning for the exhibition, but it also spread onto the lawns outside, uh, onto eight hectares of bushland, which I called Sculpture Scape, from 1973 onwards, and in the Mildura Township Centre, um, that's the sculpture scape as it appears today. A nice, neat-looking park, but it was pretty bushy originally. And uh, the artists who worked in the sculpture scape area, like Dave Morrissey, were really very experimental in what they did. 
We also used uh, empty shops, garages and a derelict bakery. So the idea of working beyond the gallery walls was not new to uh, Mildura. And I took to uh, Sydney this feeling that I'll be working in an art gallery, but I really would like to expand it beyond the gallery walls. And uh, you'll see how that happened in a, in a, a simple way. But I hope that it was one of the, the ripples that uh, uh, later led to a much greater uh, diaspora of art throughout the city of Sydney. <clears throat> there were, on the Sculpture Scape area, there were people like Tony Coling, uh, Mar Grounds with a mobile piece in the background, Dave Morrissey's little shed at the back. And uh, across the city we had various sculptures which we carted up to the city centre on a Saturday morning with information about individual artists such as Ken Unsworth's Unending Spiral to try to explain to the people of Mildura that what was happening in the art gallery was uh, understandable, relevant to their lives and so on. So I was very interested in uh, people comprehending uh, contemporary art in its, in its uh, strange and different forms. And um, we were partly successful in that and partly unsuccessful in it uh, in, in later years. One of the artists in the uh, uh, Mildura Triennials, Jim Allen, that's the work that he showed in, uh, when, what's the date there, 1973, Sculpturescape 73. It's interesting that that illustration was the one that we used in the catalogue for the 1976 Biennale of Sydney because his work then... Uh, which was a performance, There Are Always Elephants to be Made Drunk, uh, did not have an illustration. So he chose that piece, and I was very pleased that he, that he did. Jim Allen, of course, was a New Zealander at that stage, and he was the key figure for the involvement of New Zealand artists in Mildura. We had a, a, a tremendous axis uh, between New Zealand and Australia, and uh, Terry Reid sitting in the front row there. Terry, let them see where you are. Uh, he was one of the... Well, uh, we'd call him a New Zealander, but he was actually, he'd come uh, via Japan and uh, Can Canada originally. So uh, it, it was interesting that, that link, the Trans-Tasman -Ta Trans tie-up, uh, worked through key people like Jim Allen and uh, brought to Sir uh, Terry Reid. And more about that later. Um, I think that to put um, a better... Uh, perspective on things, you, you really need to refer to uh, people like um, Anne Saunders' um, uh, ANU thesis, and Anne is here today, uh, analysing the Mildura Triennial. So I refer you to that because it's online uh, uh, and is freely available, though I'd love to see it published with illustrations. It's a tremendous analysis of the Mildura Triennials, and it's, you know, there's a little commercial for you, Anne. Uh, <laughs> It really talks about contemporary cutting-edge art in the 1970s and its links with the Australian art schools that grew in that period, the colleges of arts, the employing of sculptors as teachers and lecturers, and the expanding Australian economy of that period, and the growth of population as well as government support for the arts. And Anne is the only person I know who's gone into that in great detail. And using Mildura as the example uh, sets up a, a wonderful uh, picture of the unique development of, of uh, those kinds of uh, cutting-edge arts in the 1970s, a period that people forgot about in the 1980s, I think. But it is coming back. Nothing's new. And there's ripples always, uh, you know, circulating. Um, I pressed the wrong button. Yes, I should have done that one, shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. And I've done... Uh, yes, I pressed the wrong button. There we go. That's what they told me. It would start again. There we go. So there we are, Mildura, and let's keep going. No, no, this is fine. No, no, I don't want to press the button below it. Um, by the way, the <laughs> things like Dave Morrissey, I mean, the interesting thing is that in 1973, he was reliving an experience of performance art that started in 1962. 
and uh, he reinterpreted a work by building uh, an environment from Mildura uh, 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 rubbish, on, I'd say, it was from a former rubbish tip, a little hut that he sat in there and talked to people as they came past and explained what his idea of art was about. And that was really cutting edge technology and, and, and thinking. And uh, he, it was Ben Vautier in 1962 who uh, lived that kind of an experience, but in London, I think it was in a shop front. So, you know, it was art building on art, building on art, as it does. It ripples along and it ripples along. And uh, that, that was a very thrilling uh, experience for me. It was the first time I had uh, uh, met uh, uh, a performance, a live-in artist, and it was such a... Uh, wonderful experience, like meeting the many hundreds of artists who came through Milcher at that time. So they were the models that that, ca that I carried with me through to uh, um, Sydney, and uh, shall we say, um, I was half my current age then at that stage uh, when I came to Sydney as the uh, first the first. Uh, artistic director. The 1973 triennial, uh, I, uh, sorry, Biennale of Sydney, I did not see. I wasn't here. So it really was a bit of a clean slate that I started with. But it it needed a model, so I took the model from, from Mildura. Uh, the uh, board of the uh, uh, Art Gallery of New South Wales needed to be persuaded, of course, that uh, my kind of harebrained uh, uh, entrepreneurship would work well in uh, in in a large metropolis. Uh, they needed persuading, and luckily I had a very uh, influential member of uh, the board of trustees, which was of course uh, Franco Belgiorno Netti, uh, who certainly enthusiastically supported me. Uh, I remember at that interview, and I tried to paint a word picture of um, what recent forms in international art would be like. I really didn't have the vaguest idea of what we would have because I was invited to uh, take the, the job up and I really had to uh, get my skates on. That was um, the year before, in November. And uh, I had to come to, Australia, to um, Sydney in uh, January with my family and uh, get the show together by the following November. So I really only had about nine effective months to work. Um, if it hadn't pe been for people like uh, uh, Franco and the whole Transfield uh, Prize beginnings, foundations, if you like, the Biennale would not have gotten off the ground at all. So it was, uh, for me, a, g a great thrill and a great surprise when they said, yes, away we go. <clears throat> but it was at a difficult time when people like uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, Gough Whitlam, had been um, uh, deposed, shall we say, uh, 12 months before. Well, at the time that I was uh, approached, it was when uh, the so-called coup happened. That was uh, 1975, uh, November the 11th, because we opened the Biennale 12 months later on November the 12th, 1976. More of that later. Um, so I got my skates on and traveled to uh, the idea of a Pacific Triangle selection that um, started with uh, uh, two weeks in, in Japan. And uh, I interviewed artists there, and it was with the uh, contacts that Terry Reid, once again, who'd lived in Japan, uh, furnished me with uh, recommendations and contacts. Stellark, who was living in Yokohama, uh, and people like um, the director of the Maki Gallery, those introductions were great. Mr. Anzai on, on the right-hand side, he was a great in, uh, helper and intro he introduced me to many artists, uh, Korean as well as uh, uh, Tokyo, uh, uh, as well as um, uh, Japanese artists. Uh, so I, I was exposed very quickly to um, a series of um, experimental artists whose work uh, was not um, f that far removed from what experimental art in Australia was at that time. So there was a kind of harmony that I was searching for with no great heavy thesis or, or um, uh, uh, structure to it. It was a very generalized idea. But I did, as I always did in Mildura, 
talk to artists first. I talked to the Australian artists before I went to Tokyo, Japan. I talked to Australian artists about their contacts before Leon and I went to the west coast of, of, of um, the United States. And uh, we met people such as uh, uh, Fujiko Nakaya uh, that uh, uh, Terry knew and that led to a wonderful association with Australia that uh, took us through her wonderful work, the Fog Sculpture. I wonder if we could put on that little video uh, that Stephen Jones so kindly brought along. Uh, is that possible? I'll, I'll flick in and out of these things from time to time and uh, that will help uh, you picture the, uh, the works that were current at that time. The idea of uh, Fujiko's uh, uh, fog sculpture in, in the park, it was outside the gallery, that's what I liked. I put two other works outside in the gallery, of course, um, outside the gallery, I should say. Um, there were, there were um, uh, sculptures there by uh, David Wilson and um, uh, Clive Murray White, uh, but they were so different because they were welded steel works. They were quite large, two or three uh, metres high, not like the works that you see today, which are huge, but we were working on a very tight budget. We had, I think, a target budget of $100,000 $100, for the whole project. Um, so, you know, it, it, uh, it needed to be uh, modest. But with works like Fujiko's uh, in the uh, art gallery <laughs> environment, um, you had a work that was, if you like, anti-sculpture. It, it didn't have a set form. It didn't have a set time. It depended on the weather. It changed and, and morphed. And... Um, it frightened some people who kept calling it a smog rather than a fog. <laughs> Children wouldn't go near. They were scared of breathing in the, the poisonous fumes. Uh, Fujiko was a marvelous uh, 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 ambassador for contemporary art. She explained that she was concerned with the cleanliness of, of water and the, the, its relation to the earth, and that these water droplets would not harm the environment, but in fact help the environment. And uh, the work became so easily understood by uh, the rest of uh, the population that I think that the uh, uh, publicity that it drew did a great deal of good to the Biennale because she was such a good ambassador. Uh, we'll just continue with the slides now, I think. There we go. So thank you, Fujiko. <laughs> um, then we went to the West Coast, uh, where really uh, the West Coast of America uh, and Australia, there were cultural ties there. And there was an ambience that I felt was very well related. I'd been to America before and had a feeling that what was happening on that uh, hippie border down in the 1970s and, uh, was not uh, greatly different to attitudes and, and uh, uh, um, the environment uh, that they created and, and encouraged um, would harmonize to uh, provide a kind of coherence for, for the Australian audience that they would be looking at uh, overseas contemporary art that harmonized with the works that they were doing. Whether they were influenced by the overseas works first or not is a different matter. It, it, they reflected and helped each other along. So I was able to... Um, set up the exhibition in a way that <clears throat> at the Art Gallery of New South Wales there were sections of works that appeared to harmonise and relate to each other. So I had uh, different subcategories uh, around the Art Gallery of New South Wales and I was helped greatly, of course, by the staff here. More of that later. Um, one of the things that I uh, did at the Art Gallery of New South Wales was to start off with a very modest budget and a very modest looking catalogue. This catalogue uh, was my Art Povera uh, um, version. It was uh, printed in just two colours uh, and all the illustrations were in black and white and you'll see a lot of them re reproduced here. And it was on brown uh, cardboard, corrugated cardboard and uh, brown paper inside with a Sparax binding. Um, it took a, 
a heck of a lot of work to get it together in the time because we didn't have computers in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, having the whole thing typeset and, and checked and uh, leaning on the office staff of the Visual Arts Board as well as Transfield and then eventually the um, Art Gallery of New South Wales where I moved offices from North Sydney to here. Um, I really needed a lot of um, uh, help from the outside and my colleagues here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales were, were tremendous. I, I won't uh, try to remember the names. They're, they're in my notes and I, I uh, would love to uh, call them out individually but I can't remember them offhand. As well as the catalogue, after a few weeks I felt we needed something more substantial so we put out another publication called Three Views on the Biennale. So it's in the way of being a, a, a catalogue um, essays as it were uh, to uh, help um, interpret the, uh, the attitudes to the works. Uh, the piece there that you see is a Japanese work uh, uh, which uh, was in the exhibition. And after the exhibition, I published a catalogue, uh, as it were, a scrapbook of uh, publicity for the Biennale of Sydney because I felt that the people who were not here needed to read the uh, critical comments and as well as the um, general publicity. And that was something that I always did at Mildura. Again, this was an idea that I took from Mildura. Uh, the uh, Visual Arts Board of the Australia Council helped me to publish a, a book uh, back in 1973, very lovely book, uh, colour illustrations and so on, and then by 1975 uh, and then 1978 I, I did a, a post-exhibition uh, publication uh, that uh, ended up uh, being burned and that was an interesting uh, exercise, we'll talk about that later on. Um, <clears throat> People at the Art Gallery of New South, oh yes, I, I did have the names here, Daniel Thomas, Jackie Menzies, Francis McCarthy, Robert Lindsay, Gil Docking, I think uh, David Miller, uh, Stephen Jones who's here today, you know, he took care of the, uh, the, the uh, in those days was, you know, video was a new thing and uh, we had to have somebody who knew what he was doing and uh, <laughs> we all know that Stephen in his own right has published uh, a history of performance art and uh, and his documentation is, is really good, and, and I'd like to thank Stephen for bringing along uh, material today that we're using in this uh, lecture. Um, outside the Art Gallery of New South Wales, as I said before, um, we had a couple of uh, sculptures there. There was the uh, filly by uh, Clive Murray White, um, humorously titled, but it, to my mind it was the opposite of uh, Fujiko Nakaya's work that was wreathing in the, on the lawns on the opposite side. Uh, so you had a static work, uh, very solidly built, uh, uh, fixed in time, and it probably still looks the same now as it did then, 40 years later, I hope so, I hope it did, does. Um, whereas um, Fujiko's fluxing and changing work was of a different nature, and, and that was what the recent forms in, in uh, contemporary art was meant to reflect that, that there was a wide variety. You don't have those arguments today, but it, back in the 70s, they were very legitimate arguments. What is sculpture? I didn't use the word sculpture in the title of the exhibition because I really, my whole philosophy was to broaden the uh, understanding of what uh, sculpture could be and certainly what art could be. And uh, these pieces... Um, by uh, contrast, we're, we're working to that effect. There we go. And that was where I was going to bring in the fog sculpture um, illustration. The, the interesting shot uh, that, that appeared in the, uh, in the local newspapers is the Art Gallery of New South Wales is right at the back there. So the, even the view of the Art Gallery was changed by, by that sculpture, or artwork, shall we call it. Uh, the publicity that uh, accrued from the... Uh, uh, that particular piece I reproduced in that uh, publicity scrapbook. I felt that these kinds of, of um, uh, results from an exhibition needed to be uh, used not only for our uh, Biennale and following it up, but for the next Biennale. We needed to have a record of how much stirring and publicity uh, came from the, uh, the whole exhibition, and uh, there was certainly plenty of it as well as, uh, of course, it wasn't all to do with Fujiko. There were people like uh, Stuart Brisley, uh, who came out from England. Um, 
we didn't have ma we didn't have the budget to bring artists here. I I really love the way the Biennales now can afford to bring artists to Australia. That's the way to go. It's what we did at Mildura. The, the, the artists in Mildura came to Mildura, camped out, met each other, and there was a great exchange. In those days, it was much more modest. We started off with a few, but those few that came out worked very, very hard. And Stuart Brisley's work was particularly um, uh, worth investing in because, again, it was a piece that was not inside the gallery. It was out in Hyde Park. And it engaged in the people who walked past. They weren't gallery p visitors. And Stuart, with his um, background in community arts and, and uh, the ability to communicate with people, was, was a, high, a high value contributor to the 1976 Biennale of Sydney. Um, the, the artwork um, lasted for about seven days. And again, we've got a video of that. Um, you may not be able to find that now, but look, we'll see if we can get to it. Forty-five minutes into the tape. Forty-five minutes into the tape. Well, mm, we might follow on with that. <laughs> yes. If you can find it, that would be fine. Yes, and 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 I'll just keep talking, <laughs> as I do. Um, the other sorts of works that that uh, were in the art gallery. Oh, there he is, that, that steward, yes. Uh, he constructed a cage out of um, radiata pine, uh, uh, hammering and tapping away. And the, the office workers who passed by were really intrigued by this chap. That there was no sign up saying that I am an artwork. So his engagement with them came in at all, various levels, you know, practical and so on. And, and, uh, and he didn't have any uh, covering. He spent his time... Um, eight hours a day in it at least. I think he spent his overnights there too with uh, nothing but plastic around him. He didn't have any food except what the office workers would bring uh, to him. Uh, he uh, fully uh, uh, engaged uh, the public. There were, of course, skeptics, people who, <laughs> who weren't uh, very happy with the idea of a human being in a cage and made the connections between Charles Darwin and so on and uh, evolution. Um, and Stuart was able to handle all of that very, very uh, expertly and very humanly and humanely. So the interchange between the artist and all levels of society including the Saturday night yobos, uh, <laughs> had to be handled by the artist. And, uh, you know, that, that was 1976 in Sydney, you know, and it was a very brave piece. But again, shall we say, being that kind of performance art, and it was very new in those days, it attracted a great deal of publicity. And not all of it good, but most of it was very good indeed. And it certainly spread the name that the Biennale is something <laughs> that happens beyond the walls of, of, the, of the gallery and makes an effort to engage the public and is, not con and is not involved in aesthetics and a sense of beauty. It was to do with many other issues. But um, uh, you'll see in later uh, stages, on the final day, uh, the f uh, finale was when he had completed the cage and locked himself in, he then broke out at a pre uh, organized, advertised time, and it was great. I was there, and some of you were there too. Uh, there was a great feeling of, of that epiphany, you know, that he's breaking out of the cage, and a uh, round of applause and, and so on, and, and the uh, spirit of engagement with the artist was quite profound, and an extremely successful work indeed. How long mm. was he there? Seven days. Mm. Mm. And... Uh, he survived. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving along then. Um, the next piece, the pieces that I'll talk about, are to do with the uh, static works inside the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Uh, as I said, the, the, the gallery was divided up into uh, family relationships. So we had things like... Um, uh, 
I've skipped the page. Oh yes, Kenji Togami's uh, Tension on Gravity. Oh look, they're all labelled for you to see any there anyway. I'll just keep rabbiting on. Uh, but we had various a mixture of artists, you know, like Ron Robertson Swan's uh, uh, beautiful uh, Hoffman Viaduct, which is not illustrated here, set beside Julian uh, Hawke's um, piece from England, which is made of quite different materials instead of this, this the uh, welded steel. Uh, they were soft materials, leather, logs, uh, steel rods, his kami. Um, works like um, uh, William Tucker's large uh, timber construction, K, uh, made from recycled beams, um, as well as very uh, minimal works too. Uh, Noel Hutchison's um, uh, uh, WA, W A W. I never ever find out what the W A W was about, and I must ask Noel uh, to explain that to me. But it was a very elegant and and, uh, and and beautiful piece, very understated, but not as understated as Robert Grosvenor's uh, minimalist piece from uh, the east coast of America. Uh, uh, simply a, a tube on the ground, painted, just tapered slightly at the sides. And in a, in a white uh, gallery, it sat very comfortably indeed and, and uh, showed people that kind of cross-section of uh, expression that comes from uh, the, uh, the sculptor's studio and, in some cases, goes to an extreme where it's almost drawing in space. And you have a, this beautiful uh, Nigel uh, Hall piece which I think we bought from Mildura. That was one of the pieces that we bought from Mildura. Um, through to works like um, Ellen Zimmerman's um, drawing on, on glass. Now, the interesting reason for putting this one is that Marlene Creaser, a, a Sydney artist, uh, got the instructions from Ellen and she created the work in the gallery. And they both work in transparent materials. One was a, a, a glass window with tape on it, and this was the scrolls uh, that um, Marlene uh, submitted. Elsewhere, as you moved into the uh, ground floor space, there was work by uh, New York's uh, Linda Benglis, uh, which uh, one smolten uh, aluminium uh, with the uh, intriguing title of Eat Meat, which kind of took us into an area that referred to, well, what could be... Um, uh, a repellent idea uh, from solid into liquid or from liquid into solid and uh, Gloria Keish's piece from the West Coast uh, 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 gateway piece which again we acquired for the Mildura collection um, a series of organic looking uh, tetragons with lumpy bindings that are regular joints again, sitting very beautifully in, in the white gallery space. Now, we wouldn't have been able to show that quite as effectively uh, in uh, other circumstances. I felt that they set well together and that they uh, uh, reverberated with, with um, many Australian works of, at the time in other materials. And uh, uh, when we got to the larger projects gallery, uh, we went into figurative works or works that referred to more human uh, aspects of um, the three dimensions. And this piece by Manuel Neri from California and uh, Japan's uh, uh, Kakuzu Tatihata's tiny, beautiful little bronze man, uh, kind of tongue-in-the-cheek uh, kitchen utensils and, and domestic vessel vessels called man. Uh, uh, showed a, a, a quite different attitude to the human form. Uh, Joel Shapiro's piece, again from from uh, the States, but this was uh, from the New York side, uh, in which the scale of the work is such a surprise, beside very large scale pieces, gave people a feeling of the, the breadth of uh, developments. And uh, more, again, in, in the idea of, of the human uh, form or human related forms, we had uh, Stellark's um, event for stretch skin in video as well as in photographs. He didn't come here for the performance, but he did come to Australia, uh, visited us in Melbourne, and we, uh, I saw this piece um, recreated in a lift well. Now, I, I don't like blood any more than anybody else does, but the f being in that environment with that artist, and he was so matter-of-fact, nothing mysterious or, or Zen or yoga about him. He was very practical. And 
everybody's concerned that he wouldn't hurt himself. And the fact that we had art students at, at that um, performance, uh, th there was a, a great feeling that everything would go, would please go well. And as his body moved up, mm. just supported by his skin, there was this great feeling of relief at the end of it. And uh, Stellark had everybody absolutely in the palm of his hand. He, he is a, a, a tremendous artist and uh, tests his body to the limit, but treats his body as, as his art. So it, certainly it was on a, a scale of development in the arts that um, we hadn't seen before. Uh, again, questioning what the object is, uh, is um, uh, this um, Kang So Lee's piece in which silk screens of an object and the object sitting in front question uh, what is real and what is an image of reality. Uh, further round in the same gallery we had um, uh, Shigeo Megura's um, uh, beautiful, it almost it's finished like a piece of, of um, Scandinavian furniture, very very beautiful, very fine beautifully balanced, beautifully poised, and then beside that we showed an Italian piece in which uh, uh, the, a, 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 a tree has been stripped back to its beginnings and you have the, um, the growth rings shown in uh, like knots uh, uh, emerging from what was a block of wood. Um, and then I think, where are we? We get to uh, another uh, piece in the stairwell. Uh, Mar Grounds uh, set up a, uh, an environment in which the visitors are invited to come in and talk to the artist and have an, a, an artwork created. His art bit, as he called them, uh, was made there with sand and glue and he would discuss with them uh, life, art and so on and they take away a piece of evidence uh, in, in the little art bit. It was interesting that uh, Malcolm Fraser, uh, that's a terrible image, but it shows <laughs> Malcolm Fraser, a very tall man, bent down and went into the uh, environment too, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, Im the, the importance of this was that Marr wasn't there himself, because on the opening day, the artists got up and walked out of Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser's opening speech. And um, artist, the artist was one of the protesters at the time. So I rang Mar recently and said, were you in the bunker with Malcolm? And he said, no, I was outside with the rest of the artists protesting. <laughs> um, look, there's not a great deal of time left and we could go to many extremes. I'll just flick through um, examples of works uh, works from California dealing with the feminist uh, uh, attitudes as well as a uh, lovely piece, you know, the Sydney Harbour Bridge is going to be uh, dismantled by uh, Ned, Ned Telly, <laughs> who met the, the Prime Minister on the steps of, of the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And do you notice that the man standing between Malcolm Fraser, he's, uh, he's the, uh, uh, one of his bodyguards and he's got his two-way radio, and you notice the hand pushing the artist back. Um, Terry Reid uh, uh, was, of course, engaging people with his um, uh, art in the mail, uh, ongoing work, work that started really in Mildura. I think he had to send out the invitations to uh, send secrets to, to uh, Australia and that you could exchange your secret with a, an artist overseas. And that piece was um, repeated later on in, a, in an exhibition that happened at the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art many years later, a ripple from the Biennale happened uh, much later and uh, look I can only show you the pieces as we flip through because there's a million questions uh, here and maybe not as many answers as you need but um, uh, Noel, Noel Sheridan's uh, uh, work uh, uh, I mean when I look at these works now Let's boil down to it. And I, I go out to Cockatoo Island, for instance. I, I was overwhelmed yesterday with the scale and depth and perception and analysis of the works there. And my one regret is that we 
really? We were trying to do all of this 40 years ago. The artists could have done it if there had been the money yeah. and there had been the development of art, which it takes time to happen. So I'm not apologizing for, for the small scale of things that you may see on the screen today. I'm saying these are the seeds that have beautifully ripened and flourished that you luckily have here today. And uh, I was overwhelmed to walk around the, art, the uh, Cockatoo Island uh, exhibition and find that one of the pieces that really engaged me without too much uh, effort, I don't know where I put my notes on it, oh yes, um, Yanagi's um, Landscape with an Eye In Mildura, artists were concerned with the same problems. The dangers of uh, nuclear development. Mm -hmm. Do you know the artists in Mildura in 1975, I think it was? No, 1973, two years before the, the Biennale, threatened to walk out, to, threatened to boycott my exhibition because I had been to France, organized a great exhibition of French sculpture to show simultaneously with Australian sculpture. Same thing as what we're doing, I was doing later in, in, in uh, Sydney. But the artist said, any work that it comes from France is tainted by the Bikini Atoll and the Mururoa Island nuclear tests. And what happens here 40 years later? I walk to Cockatoo Island, and there are those wonderful sculptures using the same footage from back in the 70s and the same concerns about the madness of nuclear development. Different technology, more potent maybe, but the artists back then were doing the same thing. They were using themselves as an example of protest, and that protest has been... Uh, an ongoing thing, I think, to the credit of the Biennales. They have allowed people to express their, their concerns, and it's a great freedom and something we should all treasure. And, uh, yes, I'd like to pay tribute to, to the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art because uh, the nine, uh, two th 2011 ripple from 76 went through very strongly there, and I was very thrilled to see you know, works from 1976 transformed into 2011. And works that happened in Mildura subsequently, 1978, came back to the Biennale through Klaus Rinka, who was f flabbergasted when the documentation of his work, his performance in Mildura, was in a book that the Mildura City Council decided was too radical, and they burnt 200 copies rather than sending them to the artists. So, you know, we, we had our problems in Miltura as well as you have here in Sydney. And, um, you know, that, that, they were the headlines back in 1973. And it was a beautiful ripple, you know, to see that artists dealing with things, maybe in a different way, but having the same concerns. And I think I should finish on that point. There's many other things that I'd like to talk about, but... Yeah, we, I have taken a lot of your time today. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. And could, could we have Stephen's, the rest of Stephen's tape just uh, running in the background while we have our wind up? Thank you. And uh, maybe, yeah, we can have some questions while we're looking at the video. Yeah, we can bring around the microphone if you have a question. That's Michael McMillan. Yes, he was one of the few visiting artists that we had uh, for, for, 19, oh, thank, for 1976, Michael McMillan. And uh, he, he had a, a very amusing uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, exhibit, uh, and it was called, what, The Robot? Robot. 
the trunk robot, yes. And you had to put your money in uh, to get the story, which was all made up and complete fantasy. And it was that nice Californian attitude to, you know, art doesn't always need to be heavy, heavy stuff. It can be a bit of fun too. And it plays with the idea that people, you know, will pay good money for quite stupid things at times. <laughs> And I guess it, ca it, it called on, on, on things like, you know, Hollywood and all that fantasy that uh, happens uh, in that part of the country. Uh, Michael's a... Fake news. <laughs> fake news. <laughs> began in 76 back here in Sydney, and, and it's still going. <laughs> <laughs> right. He worked in the film industry, as you know. Yes, yes, and, and then that's that's the kind of thing. You know, the the different background that each artist has is showcased one way or another in their work. Same as their psychology. It, you know, it it it, uh, it gives people a chance to find out about a life that you you yourself may not ever use. Question. Question. That should be done. Now, this is probably just a naive observation, but I, you know, this seems so very fresh. I feel mm. like so much of this, I could have seen this yesterday on Cockatoo mm. Island and, and been just as blown away by it. And it makes me think that, you know, so often we get caught up with um, the need for the new and, and to, yeah, the need for the, for the new all the time, perhaps a little bit of the shock, like an ongoing avant-garde. And yet, clearly, the resonance, it, it's not just a resonance, but sort of, the connections between this show uh, and Mummy's show, you feel like it's actually, it's part of a bigger cycle and uh, history will show these to be part of the same thing, not two events separated by a great period of time. And I guess uh, for those of us that love our art history <laughs> and our history generally, um, that's what's lovely about it. And I think that's the beauty of bringing the archive together and bringing the archive out, is what we're seeing is this lovely, slow kind of burn of ideas that get reassessed and reevaluated and just reinvented and represented and and it's not that they're they're repeated it's just that the value is still in the work and it's mm. still relevant and still still um, resonates so um congratulations Tom it was a wonderful show I can remember it <laughs> um, and thank you mummy because this has been a wonderful show as well so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one of the strengths of this show is that lineage in it. Um, I, <laughs> you give this to me when I finish talking. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I like that idea that it's not simply the new that streams of art activity are brought into focus in the same exhibition, which this exhibition does very well. And, oh, curious, does the Maki Gallery still exist? It would I be long gone, I would yeah, think. I would think so. Yeah. The director has passed away, I know that. Uh, so many people have uh, <laughs> passed away. <laughs> yes. Uh, Nak Nakahara Yusuke, well, uh, 10th, 10th <laughs> Tokyo Biennale. Uh, he was but the a, he art was lives on. Very the art person, lives on. A very uh, great contributor. Thank you. Thank you. I suppose I had a couple of questions. Well, one, one question, Tom, was uh, you mentioned three places uh, that you travelled to. So Japan, West Coast, and where was the other? <laughs> Australia. Oh, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> had to go a long way for that. Uh, well, uh, I'd been to New Zealand a couple of times, and this, I, I felt confident with what was happening in Australia and the links between the two. But I must confess that I did not involve as many New Zealanders in the exhibition as, as I would wish to have. Uh, but then I didn't involve as many women in the exhibition as I would have wished to have. And the interesting thing is that the, river the, 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 the ripple from that was that the next Biennale director, uh, Nick Waterlow, uh, had to take up the slack <laughs> and it was encouraging that artists uh, complained that there were things that didn't please them in the, in the 76 Biennale and they insisted on having some input and, and that is what makes a, a, an exhibition lively and worthwhile because uh, people say, well, it is important enough to be... Um, uh, concerning 
and, and that our concern should be met. So I, I, I left behind a few little time bombs <laughs> as well as <laughs> patterns to be followed. And, and those time bombs are just as important. Can I just make another comment? I wouldn't mind hearing your reaction to that, but uh, I'd always felt that the Biennale, because of its scale, actually um, in, impressed, if you like, contemporary art on the public's imagination. People couldn't sort of ignore it. So how did you feel about that in your show? Was there an element of that? Uh, yes, I think I think that's why I put the uh, publicity brochure out. Uh, I, I felt that um, uh, you, it doesn't happen in a vacuum, and the, that the ripples that come out from it can affect uh, all sorts of people in all sorts of ways. But uh, I noticed that uh, uh, the funding for the biennales had to be um, worked on very hard, even in the beginnings. If you go down and look at the, in the uh, archives. Uh, the Visual Arts Board weren't all that happy about coming in very early to fund the, uh, the 76 Biennale and it took a lot of hot spade work. And I think that once it's demonstrated these, that the exhibitions do uh, cause ripples and do stir people up and sometimes anger and, and uh, you know, very often uh, shock horror, uh, when it settles down people say yeah, it, it, the, it did happen, it was an important thing. And you talked about scale. You see, the scale of things now is tremendous. It's huge. And uh, when I saw uh, Ai Weiwei's uh, large uh, piece uh, uh, on Cockatoo Island, I felt, yes, that it deserves that scale. And it's uh, where artists ca have this tremendous ability to take an idea and their imagination blows it up into something that says, stop, you know, have a look at this. And it's not like seeing it on television a, a split second. It's real, it's tangible, it's bigger than we are and we need to fund things at that scale to make any impression on, on the public today because we are you know, a more sophisticated society. We have had 40 years of, of um, development and in media and so on and it's great to see that artists exploit that media in ways that we couldn't have 40 years ago. Tom, both an observation and, and, and a question as well. Just a bit further on, on what Luke was actually asking is, I do remember in the research that um, you involve quite a lot of the, con the commercial galleries and also sculpt the, the Sculpture Centre as well. So, I mean, you'd brought all of that kind of extensive work you've been doing in Sculpturescape and Mildura to Sydney and it went far beyond the bounds of, of just the gallery and the domain as well. Yes, so there, was, there was a little... Um leaflet and on the back of it we had a schedule of activities mm. that were happening around and the mm. sculpture centre especially mm. uh, put on a, 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 a program there. Terry you would remember that with Betty Kelly the, uh, mm. the whole parallel program that happened uh, and uh, again the art schools uh, were a great support. Uh, Tony Colling, I remember was involved with some art students and they were uh, dressed in boxes, I think, out and wa walking through the, the, uh, the grounds. And, you know, that's, that, that was like fringe activities of the Biennale of 1976. Mm -hmm. And this is it. The bigger the fringe, the better. Mm -hmm. Now, the real problem is to keep it coherent in some sort of way. Mm -hmm. and, and, again, to have a, a separate um, artistic director is the only way you can... Mm -hmm keep that in control but it's it's a variable that will happen and things don't repeat themselves automatically they'd be boring otherwise so uh, yes you do you do run a risk with those sorts of things too but the fringe activities sometimes can uh, take over one mm. quick question as well um, a number of the artists remained in Australia I think you've got some funding and I know some of them actually went to Mildura afterwards if you've got some stories or just some remembrances, I mean, I thought that was, again, a real init a first initiative in terms of the, the Biennale of actually sort of integrating those artists having come out here and made their work, taking them further into Australia as well. Yes, and I think we can thank the Australia Council for funding some of those tours that went on and, and still mm. do, I think. Um, yes, the the... the uh, one of the great benefits of the Biennales of Sydney is that people in regional centres as well as in other uh, capital cities uh, have the benefit of these uh, international artists coming around. And uh, People like René Bloch, for instance. I, I'd been to Germany and I was trying to get um, uh, Joseph Boyce to come out to the exhibition and, and I met Joseph and... <laughs> 
Oh, Mr. McCullough, how's my friend Ned Kelly? <laughs> Straight off the top of his head in Dusseldorf, you know. <laughs> um, yes, it, it was great. And, and um, you, when um, Klaus Rinker came out, you know, we flew with Klaus up to um, Broken Hill. And he was so interested in, in Australian life, being so different to European life. And we showed him uh, uh, the film Wake and Fright <laughs> before we took him to Broken Hill. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, you, you learn from their opinion of what we're doing. And the interesting thing is that one of, uh, that's right, at the next Biennale of Sydney, Klaus called his exhibit, They Have More Than Bushfires in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a two-way street. That's Jim Allen with uh, the performance called... Yes, there is, there is, there is sound to this. Uh, I mean, uh, he's. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But I felt today. Another question? Yes, thank you. Uh, not so much a question, but I, um, Clay Eggleston did most of the work with the archive that's downstairs. But I helped because I also work in the archive here. And one of the beautiful little th snippets about the '76 Biennale, which I found, is John Davis being invited by. Frank Waters to put a work into the sculpture show that Frank Waters was having as a bit of a side and basically saying, well, I'm coming up in the ute with my work for the Biennale. I'll just throw something in the corner. <laughs> and that work actually came into our, someone bought it for our collection. A donor bought it for us. <laughs> so something, you know, something came out of it. Well, the, yes, and I knew John very well. He was born the same year as I was and we both taught at the same high school. Uh, Mildura High School. <laughs> we were art teachers at Mildura High School. And um, I went my way and he went his way. But um, we had a close association over the years. But Mildura, <clears throat> as I said, uh, bought a few pieces. We actually acquired 16 pieces from the Biennale, 1976 Biennale of Sydney. It's in the footnotes to, to, my, to my lecture. And... Um, that, again, was a good model that I felt that, that should go forward by bringing works into the country. So your Biennale disseminates tangible things as well as the intangible things, and it, it creates the art market atmosphere that it was not set up to do, but that it does happen. And Jim, Jim is still uh, screwing up newspapers. <laughs> the, title, the title for his work, by the way, I found in a book that was published in the 1960s. And uh, yes, it, it doesn't explain what the work is, but it was to do with people searching for something, f being frustrated and searching for something. So, I mean, this man that's frantically handling a newspaper, tr looking for something, and then screwing it up, throwing it down, has, has um, uh, some sort of a relevance when yeah, you know what the... Well, it's, it's either that or fish and chips, isn't it? <laughs> We're running over time. Now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, it's a good um, timing to close this session, but... Uh, it's, it's so fascinating to see some things might have changed completely, but as some of you might mentioned, some things is still so relevant to look at it again. And uh, having, even for my Biennale, having uh, Sydney Ball from 1973, and then also works from uh, Lily Dujuli from 1972, and Richard and Pablo, they're all coming from 70s. It's so relevant to see it now, together with the artists beyond time and place. So I think it's beautiful t that we all connected with the contemporary art and see different time and space from our different perspectives. And uh, I'm so grateful that uh, I did this series
series, and uh, all of you, so many times I, I, I saw you in the audience. And so I'd just like to say thank you for all of you, and then also thank you for uh, Tom, for the wonderful talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>